Today's Journal Club is based on an article published recently by Dr. John Piero Plermo and Derek Keating in the Journal of Assisted Reproductive and Genetics. This manuscript reviews early assisted fertilization attempts that eventually led to the development of ICSI and discusses its current utilization in cases of male and non-male factor infertility. For today's Journal Club, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. John Piero Palermo and Derek Keening from Will Cornell Medicine. Dr. Palermo is a professor of reproductive medicine at the Ronald Perlman and Claudia Cohen Center for Reproductive Medicine. He received his medical degree from the University of Bari in Italy and obtained his PhD in reproduction and development from Monash University. He is board certified in both OBGYN and reproductive endocrinology. And after completing his residency in OBGYN and his fellowship in reproductive endocrinology, he became the director of assisted fertilization and andrology in 1993 at New York Presbyterian World Cornell Medical Center. Dr. Palermo was the first to describe ICSI, a solution to complete and unexpected fertilization failure with in vitro fertilization and male factor infertility in 1992. Since then, it has become the most utilized assisted reproductive technology in the world. Dr. Palermo specializes in the assessment and treatment of the infertile man, including sophisticated and non-traditional sperm preparation techniques and the correction of fertilization failure. Dr. Palermo, I never had the pleasure of working directly with you, but my mentors, Dr. Jacques Cohen and Dr. Mina Alakani, have always held you in the highest regard. And early in my career, I studied many advancements that you've made to the field. So I'm looking forward to today and learning more about your colleague, Derek, as you introduce him. Thank you, Kelly. Well, hello, everyone. First, I wish to thank the Cooper Surgical for this opportunity to share our experience with X in this journal club. So the whole idea started when I gave a presentation at the Koji meeting in London in 2018. Mainly the focus was to try to identify the reason why X is so popular and also to kind of face the criticism that sometimes we heard about X being overutilized. Mainly the question they asked me was, do you think we should use ICSI for all cases of assisted reproductive technology? So that's make me think about, and so I discussed with the team. So we try to see instead of whether people should use it or not, or whether what are the reasons that brought to the popularity of ICSI and why we prefer so much this procedure here at the Center for Reproductive Medicine and White Cornell Medicine in New York. So, Derek Keating has been with us for over four years as part of the ICSI team, and he has been uh, co uh, the coordinator of this work that brought to the, our publication. So he will describe our article. So Derek. I'd like to thank Cooper Surgical, Kelly, and of course, Dr. Palermo for the opportunity to share our work with you today, uh, titled Thoughts on the Popularity of ICSI, which we published in 2020 on the Journal of Assisted Reproduction and Genetics. Briefly, Dr. Palermo has nothing to disclose. I have nothing to disclose. And all slides and videos are proprietary information of Wild Cornell. It would be impossible to discuss the advent of ICSI without first starting with the work of Bob Edwards and Patrick Steptoe, the collaboration of which resulted in the birth of Louise Brown to a woman with tubal occlusion. This marked the first successful attempt at in vitro fertilization. Since the implementation of this novel reproductive technique, it did not take too long to notice in the mid 80s that up to 40% of these cases had unexpected fertilization failure due to clear and also subtle male factor indications. The race to find the best method to address male factor infertility was quickly reported. This approach ranged from zonal drilling and zonal softening as well as creating a small slit within the zona pellucida. This technique then eventually became more commonly used with subzonal injection, where spermatozoa were placed with a micropipette directly into the paravitalin space. It was this technique that a young doctor in Belgium, Gian Piero Palermo, was practicing on first on mice, and once successful, he was allowed to do it on humans, where he injected three sperm into the paravillin space of human oocytes. 
However, one day by doing this, he accidentally pierced the plasma membrane of a human oocyte while, while performing SUSY. The 11 SUSY oocytes were complete fertilization failure. However, that one oocyte that was injected by ICSI eventually fertilized normally at 2 p.m. and was eventually transferred into a 30-year-old woman. This led to a healthy pregnancy and the delivery of a child. Here on the left, we have the report of the first four ICSI pregnancies. And on the right, a comparison of cohorts of men of oocytes injected by subzonal, subzonal insemination and intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So it was quickly the ultimate tool in 1992 to treat male factor infertility and was used with TESI and epididymal spermatozoa and quickly their cryopreserved counterparts. Eventually, it was then used with cryopreserved oocytes and then for cases in which the genetic material of the resulting embryos was tested. To perform ICSI, you need sophisticated equipment and skilled embryologists. In the 27 years of ICSI, the laboratory has not changed much, nor anywhere near as near as much as the indications for its utilization. If you exclude combined or unexplained causes of infertility, male and female factors are equally attributable to a couple's inability to conceive. And so ICSI was conceived with the goal to address male factor infertility indications. We would all agree that ICSI can address things such as extremely compromised semen parameters, globozoospermia, cryptozoospermia, and obviously can be used with epididymal and testicular sperm. The initial assessment of a man's fertility is the semen analysis, which reviews things like abstinence period, the volume of the sample, and the viscosity, but also very important details such as the concentration of spermatozoa, motility and viability if motility is not present, as well as the morphology of the spermatozoa or the number displaying normal forms. It also can assess supernumerary cells that are non-sperm in the semen sample, such as red blood cells or ground cells. However, this test doesn't really tell us anything about the functional capacity of the sperm, especially in its ability to fertilize an oocyte and lead to a healthy pregnancy. Generally, the evaluation of the male partner includes two semen analyses. If normal, the focus shifts towards the female partner and these couples can undergo an intrauterine insemination or standard in vitro insemination. The evaluation of the male partner, if abnormal, we can do some additional hormonal testing. And if those tests come back abnormal, we can work with a reproductive urologist to optimize and treat the male factor present. However, if the, super, if the extra tests on hormones come back normal for the male, we can then start to theorize on the optimal treatment method for the couple. One of the tests that can be done in the event of azospermia is a genetic test, especially one looking at the Y chromosome. Here we have a depiction of Y chromosomes of some patients. Uh, each multiplex, A, B, C, and D, represent different deletions that can occur. Uh, the sample in the fifth well is uh, the patient. Uh, number two is a normal man. Number four is empty. And number two is a female. So AZFC A and B deletions are characterized by a complete lack of spermatozoa. However, a study showed that AZFC deletions can lead to some sperm generation, although the concentration of spermatozoa in the ejaculate is inversely related to the number, uh, to the length of the deletion. And then a study was done on these men that showed that the use of ejaculated or testicular sperm can lead to normal fertilization and also generate pregnancies with ICSI. With the presence of spermatozoa in the semen analysis, we can then do a good examination of the semen sample, which is paramount. By just visualizing these sperm here, we can see that there's an issue with the midpiece, which will then allow us to look into things like the centrosome. And we do a number of these extra assays to assess the functional capacity of the sperm. So we can begin with a ploidy assessment, usually done by FISH or next generation sequencing more recently. 
We can also assess the presence of PLC zeta, which is necessary to activate an oocyte following fertilization. We can also assess for the centrosome, which is important for the first mitotic division following fertilization. And most recently, and becoming more popular, is an assessment of the DNA integrity of the spermatozoa, which is done by tunnel, where sperm chromatin structure assay and has been directly linked abnormal DNA fragmentation has been directly linked to an inability to conceive with IUI and standard in vitro insemination. For these patients, we are able to utilize both the ejaculated spermatozoa using a microfluidic device if the DNA fragmentation is abnormal, or a reproductive urologist can take these patients to TESI to obtain surgically retrieved gametes. Globozoospermia is a rare condition where spermatozoa are characterized by round heads, absent acrosomes, and non-compacted chromatin. In our most recent observations, we distinguish between partial and complete forms of globozoospermia. Partial globozoospermia can be treated by the selection of the most morphologically normal spermatozoon to inject by a skilled ICSI operator. Complete globozoospermia requires ICSI in conjunction with assisted gamete treatment in an attempt to jumpstart fertilization. If the sample is azospheric, genetic testing can help shed the light on the root cause. Depicted here is a cohort of 1,500 Japanese men that concludes that a large number, about 12 to 13% of men had autosomal abnormalities. Intriguingly, there was also a large number that had gonosomal abnormalities, the majority of which were, part, were complete or mosaic Kleinfelter forms. And here we have a video of one of our reproductive urologists at Cornell performing microsurgical testicular sperm extraction. You can see as they identify the most dilated seminiferous tubules in an attempt to sex successfully retrieve gametes. Surgically retrieved specimens often require extensive searching by multiple embryologists in order to identify an adequate number of spermatozoa needed for insemination. This is why ICSI is so important for these couples. And while there is no question the role of ICSI for the previously described male factor infertility, more debatable are non-male factor indications for ICSI that have come about due to the versatility of this technique. One such example is oocyte dysmorphism. With standard in vitro insemination, the oocyte is not visualized until the following day after the insemination. It is known that these oocytes fertilize less optimally with this technique. And it's important to note that we are not here to propose ICSI as the sole insemination method for, treat for couples. Through our manuscript, we tried to understand the phenomenon, the conditions that have brought the large utilization of ICSI. One example is the increasing trend of crowd-preserving oocytes. This is the SART data from 2018. Most centers prefer ICSI for cycles with frozen thawed oocytes. So we can conclude that a larger number of oocyte cryopreservation cycles will eventually lead to a larger utilization of ICSI. Another phenomenon is the increase of ART cycles that we see with a concurrent increase in the utilization of pre-implantation genetic testing. Again, ICSI is the preferred method used by most centers for cycles that utilize PGT. And as seen on the left, ICSI in 2011 was utilized in almost two thirds of ART treatment cycles worldwide. On the right, we have our own data from Cornell. Indeed, almost all of our assisted reproductive technique treatments in 2019 were with ICSI. This is a more in-depth view of the data reported by the International Committee for Monitoring Assisted Reproductive Technologies from 2011. Over 1.1 million ART cycles were performed worldwide with almost 400,000 newborns. In total, 65 countries were included in the study. And here in yellow, we start to see some of the countries that reported the use of both IVF and ICSI. In light blue, we're beginning to see countries where over 80% of all ART treatments were ICSI. And in dark blue, finally, our countries were almost all ART treatments, more than 90% are done by ICSI. From our analysis of the literature and the trends of ART worldwide, we were able to conclude that ICSI is an indispensable tool for any and every ART treatment center worldwide due to its many indications. 
There is no one clear and uniform utilization protocol used worldwide. And while male factor infertility indications are unwavering, the debate continues regarding non-male factor indications for ICSI among these cryopreservation of oocytes or the use of pre-implantation genetic testing. And ICSI appears as, and may actually be, an evolution of the in vitro fertilization process itself. Finally, we are left to wonder whether it is more important to identify the real indications for ICSI or to accept that as a technique capable of offering a more consistent and versatile outcome. I'd like to thank everybody for coming here to listen.